From New York City, for our viewers worldwide, a very good morning. I'm Manus Cranian for Jonathan Farrow. Despite the rise in yields, 24 basis points in six days, these equity markets have a sense of immunity. Will it last? Count down to the open. Kicks in right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up, Treasury yields rise to their highest levels of 2024. Jimmy Diamond warning of stickier inflation and higher rates. And Secretary Yellen wraps up her high-level talks in China. We begin with the big issue. Global bond yields keep on moving higher. Yield levels are a challenge, but also the pace of the moves um, will be an even greater challenge you know, with a bit of my FX hat on. Sometimes it's not about levels, it's about the speed at which you get to certain levels. If I compare the move you know, from four to four and a half right now in the 10 year, somewhat slower compared to the rounds of air steepening that we had last year. But if this accelerates, that, that tightens financial conditions much more uh, quickly than markets are, are ready for, then you get the volatility. It's not the destination, it is the speed at which we get there. Let's have that conversation now with Morgan Stanley's Katerina Simonetti and Peter Shafik of RBC Capital Markets. Peter, I put it to you that the bond burrs, they have been singed, but they have not been burnt. This acceleration in the bond market, 24 basis points in six days, is this the beginning of a more significant route to come in the bond market? Good morning. Good morning. Well, first of all, I think the risk is clearly there because uh, it's interesting also to see on where it came from because initially when it started, it basically came from nothing. So there was no real data out there. There was no real macro catalyst to sort of spark it. Clearly, towards the end of last week, we had the non-farm release, which was um, pretty strong. But by and large, the start of that came out of nothing. So, and that in my mind is also indica indicative um, that there is sort of some underlying probably imbalances in terms of positioning. And if I may add one of the other things uh, that potentially could accelerate it, it has been driven predominantly out of the US. Our markets over here in Europe, yes, they traded high on yields as well, but not to the same magnitude. We outperformed. If we were to share in, I think there could be another push higher um, in yields. Well, I think Asia and Europe are, are, the, are the additional four basis points that you've had in, in the overnight session. Um, Katarina, good morning. I like what you say, which is take advantage of the higher yields. Scoop them up. Coupon clip. Make hay while the yield spike shines. Well, that's exactly right. You know, S&P 500 is up almost 10% for the year, and this is after being up 24% in the previous year. So investors are getting concerned, rightfully so, given the geopolitical environment, given the, you know, the, the charged political environment here in the U.S. So they absolutely should take advantage of the higher yield if they want to take some of that risk off the table, because you can see the interest rate environment that is conducive of these yields in corporate bonds, in treasuries, in high yield. So this is the time to build a diversified fixed income portfolio. And now is absolutely the time to extend the duration and position the fixed income portfolio as the pivotal, important part of the total diversified asset allocation. OK, and we could indeed, you know, investors sort of smell maybe 5% could be on the table. We can talk about that in just a moment because we're bracing for another busy week on the inflation front. CPI will be in focus. Mikey McKee is with me. Again, we expect, Mike, a drop in the core, but the year-on-year -year could still be quite a distance from the Fed's target. We will end up quite a distance from the Fed's target by the end of the week after the inflation numbers. The question is, where will the market be? Let's look at where we are right now, Manis. Uh, the Fed's uh, effective Fed funds rate, 5.33 percent. Now, by the end of the year, we're expected to be just above 470. So what we're looking at is only two rate cuts priced in by the markets right now. We shall see if that uh, does play out over the week as we get this kind of data. Uh, we have two Fed speakers today, then Wednesday, the CPI and the Fed minutes. That should play a lot into it. On Thursday, we get PPI, jobless claims, three more Fed speakers, and then Friday, import prices. 
Uh, another inflation look, Michigan sentiment. What do people think inflation is going to be? And finally, two more Fed speakers. So a, a lot to look forward to. In terms of the CPI, you're right. We're expecting the headline and core month-over-month -month numbers to drop. But for the headline, the year-over-year -year number goes up in part because of base effects, basically. Uh, the core goes down a little, but still would finish at 3.7. Remember, the Fed's looking for two. Now, this is not the Fed's indicator but it is still what most people think about. Uh, will it affect the market? That's an interesting question because we have seen a lot of CPI volatility in previous months. On the day that the CPI comes out, the two-year note yield has adjusted by quite a bit, except for the last couple of times. Now, this volatility coming out of the markets, and you have to wonder if people are just getting used to the fact that inflation isn't going to move much, and so they're already prepositioned. We'll find out after the number. Okay, Mike, thank you very much. Um, if we take that, Peter, and you say the flow would be that this move in the bond market pretty much came from nowhere, but I put it to you that the oil markets are really quite aggressively punching higher, uh, over $90. They rallied by 4% last week on Brent. Now, that doesn't dislocate inflation expectations, but it certainly can begin to seep into the bond psyche, can't it? One of the um, upside risk or potential upside risks um, for inflation. In fact, um, when you look at sort of the most recent, so, so what we quite often look at, we look at where the actual outcome is relative to where the market was positioning beforehand, where the market was expecting it. In the last couple of releases, we've seen an upside surprise. Um, to those um, consensus forecasts that were out there. And we think that the risk um, going into this uh, week's release is uh, probably tilted in the same direction. And, and as you said, oil price is probably one of the reasons for that as well. Uh, and if I may say, um, again, I, I want to repeat the point for emphasis, one of the things that we haven't really seen sort of in this latest bond market round is sort of a, a, a global share in as we had uh, sort of uh, late last year. And, and I think this is also where another source of risk potentially comes from, that it sort of spreads out um, and is more broad based. If I flick it over, Katerina, to the equity side, I know that you've upgraded your equity sector to overweight. And I was looking at the S&P performance over the past month, and it is down to all the commodities, the gold. I know it's Freeport, McMoran and Splendid Isolation, but th there is a robust... Uh, let's say, momentum behind the commodity components within the S&P. Is that breadth reaching or is it inflation hedging, do you think? We think it's a little bit of both. We've upgraded our outlook on energy two weeks ago. Uh, and we also like the materials and industrials, both on the fundamentals and commodity support. But we also are seeing that flight to safety per se, because, you know, when you look at the uptick in gold, energy, industrials, materials, they're all defensive asset classes. You know, we also like the sectors of the market where the companies are uh, being responsible with the, the costs and, you know, our competitively positions are showing the operational efficiency, you know, in healthcare, in financials. Um, and, uh, you know, all of this, I think, it's that flight to safety, you know, considering that the performance in the market has happened in this very few equity names and, you know, just, just few sectors. So this is an absolutely great time to rebalance the portfolios and go back to basics where investors should be looking at their, you know, total allocation. And if any of it is skewed to which any one sector or individual name, this is certainly the time to rebalance because as always, we, you know, we hope for the best, but we have to prepare for the worst. And as part of that rebalancing going for the mid caps in your view, I mean, we don't know when the Fed will go and there has been a severe paring back of the, the scale of this cycle of cuts. So the timing of going for mid caps and small caps is perhaps harder and becoming more difficult as we price out rate cuts this year. Well, absolutely. And when we, we look towards the rate cuts, and we know there are going to be some rate cuts this year, historically, large caps perform well right after the rate cuts. But this is followed by mid and small caps, although that might be a delayed performance or delayed effect. So what we tell the investors is that overall positioning, you have to think not just few months out or even a year out. There has to be a long-term strategy, you know, that we employ when we put together these strategic, you know, asset allocations. So, you know, mid caps and small caps absolutely play a role in the portfolio, although we should not expect that immediate effect, you know, just following the rate cuts.
Peter, obviously you're centred back in Europe and the view this week we have the ECB. You talk about the lack of a global bond right thus far. Do you think that that will accelerate at a global level? And, and, and what do you think we get from the ECB? Well, I mean, first of all, there's, there's obviously not going to be um, any rate cuts um, coming um, this week. And the question really in my mind is how they're going to prepare for the most likely outcome, which is a June cut, because most of the speakers from the ECB have indicated that much. But when you look at, when, uh, particularly over here in Europe, we are now pricing significantly more rate cuts um, than, for instance, in the U.S., um, and um, it seems questionable in my mind that if we continue scaling down some of these expectations in the U.S., um, that Europe can stay with basically three and a half to four cuts um, uh, for this year. So uh, in my mind, that is sort of the risk that we're facing out of Europe. And um, particularly if, um, on Thursday, they're not really sort of endorsing, let's say, a back-to-back -back rate cut. Um, I think we could also be seeing a mar negative market reaction after Thursday. OK, well, let's keep an eye on those spreads. Just one other thing which caught my mind, this is to both of you, is gold. We've got the PBOC buying gold for the 17th month in a row. We've got the RBI confirming that they are deeply involved in the gold market. So, Peter, let me put it to you from the bond perspective, first of all, which is if central banks of China and India are bountiful and buying gold, we run closer and closer risks of some kind of a moment of where they're not buying U.S. Treasuries in the same volume. Is that, is that just a very, very small tail risk, or is there something else that you take away from that very significant buying of gold by other central banks? Well, first of all, I think the, the half sentence that you just used um, at, at the same magnitude, in my mind, is key. So because clearly um, these very large um, official investors and others, uh, there, there's very little way around in buying some um, and, and probably still very meaningful sizes uh, of U.S. Treasuries or other government bonds um, in particular. And also what we've seen, of course, is that um, at the, and we just heard sort of the recommendation um, for, you know, uh, other investors to buy Treasuries at these yields. We've seen a pickup sort of in domestic buying um, of government bonds um, and uh, clearly to some degree they're offsetting. So, I mean, there's clearly a concern on investors' minds um, and more broadly that there is a lack of buying. But for the time being, we haven't seen that. And Katrina, just to wrap it up with a bow, I've, I've had a whole variety of uh, elements come into my inbox about how to reach broader within AI, go beyond the MAG7. How do you go beyond MAG7 to take advantage of, of the AI craze? Well, there is a tremendous pressure on earnings to support the current inflated um, equity prices. And, uh, you know, when we look at, at, at the total, this is the time to go to back to fundamentals, to positive cash flows, uh, to companies with competitive positioning. These are the names that are going to be rewarded this year. You know, and the dividend paying aspect of the owning equities cannot be overvalued, especially right now. Mm -hmm. you know, we want to make sure that there is that positive cash flow that is coming not just from fixed income, but also from the equity part of the portfolio. And gold, for example, as much as we think of it as a safe haven asset, the negative in gold is that it's a non-yielding asset yeah. class. And so this is the time to take advantage of some of these areas in the market that did not have a strong run-up and also take some profits on the table in the areas in our portfolios that have done so well, unexpectedly well, because the balance is more important than ever, especially right now. Thank you so much for being with me, Katerina Simonetti and Peter Shafik on the market setting the agenda this Monday morning. Let's look under the hood ahead of the opening bell. Abigail Doolittle is with me as she is every day. Abby, what have we got? We've got some outsized uh, movers this morning, Manus. If we look beneath the relatively benign surface of stocks up just a little bit, take a look at the shares of apartment income REIT. Blackstone is buying or taking private the apartment REIT uh, air communities uh, for about $10 billion, a little more than $39 per, per share, multifamily uh, with in the commercial real estate sector. Uh, fairly good. Region by region, they own in lots of different regions. Interestingly, this company went public just a couple of years ago, right now trading at levels around where it went public. Tesla up 2.3 percent. Elon Musk last Friday uh, saying that Tesla robotaxi is on its way. And now we know that it will be unveiled in August. Uh, it's key for this company to find new sources of growth. And then Boeing, not so much, down about nine-tenths of one percent. More mishaps for Boeing planes this time on Southwest. There was a plane leaving Denver International Airport, a piece of its engine cumber fell off and then hit the wing. The plane had to return to the airport and those passengers then put on another plane, maybe a little bit rattled, going down to Houston, Manus. Okay, Abby. Uh, thank you very much. Abigail Doolittle on the very 
latest move in stocks. Coming up, Secretary Yellen's balancing act. When the global market is flooded by artificially cheap Chinese products, the viability of American and other foreign firms is put into question. Janet Yellen wraps up her visit to China. We discuss the latest news flow right here on Bloomberg. China is now simply too large for the rest of the world to absorb this enormous capacity. Actions taken by the PRC today can shift world prices. And when the global market is flooded by artificially cheap Chinese products, the viability of American and other foreign firms is put into question. Yellen balancing stark criticism with the efforts to strengthen its ties during her China visit. Framing China's strategy of boosting its manufacturing capacity as a global concern and urging the leaders to focus on uh, revving up domestic demand. Bloomberg's Ender Karen is with us. And there's some pretty punchy talk from Yellen when she's in country, in front of her audience. She didn't hold back, did she? No, she was both critical and cordial, like you say, Manus. On the criticism front, she really went for China when it comes to... Uh, accusing them of exporting their excess capacity in the manufacturing sector. And interestingly, she said that's not just hurting U.S. companies and jobs. She said it's hurting global companies and jobs, too. So maybe hint there that she's trying to build an alliance when it comes to drumming up support for this overcapacity idea. So she had stinging criticism for China's economic growth strategy, criticism of their use of subsidies. Of course, she also brought up China's support for Russia, uh, she made a warning there about what that might entail. And she encouraged China to drum up its own domestic demand, enough domestic demand that would buy and hoover up the production that China is churning out from its factories rather than send it overseas. And the thinking is that these are fairly hawkish comments from Ms. Yellen because the U.S. has some economic leverage over China at the moment. But, of course, China pushed back in this criticism too, and they say that it's merely laying the groundwork by the U.S. to put more tariffs or other export controls on, on China's economy. And we are just seeing that there's a, a Bloomberg story. It's, it's probably before you sat down in the seat. And, and this is the result of the Yellen meetings. Um, you, you have the deputy finance minister uh, saying that China and the U.S. will discuss balanced growth in their domestic and global economies uh, and that there will be two agreements to that effect. If I said to you what was the most tangible thing, I mean, we're now getting a little bit of detail that, that there are going to be these two, two agreements. But what will change, Enda? What do you think will change? Is it the theatre and language, or is it actualities? I think there's kind of there's two ways of looking at it. Some people are saying that Miss Yellen has gone there to lay the groundwork for potentially extra tariffs or other kind of restrictions on Chinese goods or investment into China. So she's laying the groundwork that the US is not happy with what's going on in China's manufacturing sector. It's, it's giving them an unfair competitive advantage. So uh, giving them cause and reason for some actions down the road. But it's also a view that, you know, this just merely adds to the idea that both sides are kind of playing time out now at the moment. They want to stabilize relations. Yeah. China, of course, is watching the clock. They're not going to make any major moves this side of the US election. They know US policy could change dramatically once we get to November. So both sides are watching the clock a little bit. Both sides are talking their book, but really just stabilizing things until the next big moment in US-China relations, and that's probably not going to come until after that election in November. No, clarity will be delivered then, and just on the, on the additional line there, they will continue to exchange views on financial stability, sustainable finance, and anti-money laundering in the financial working group meetings. So that, that's the commitments um, that they have, uh, the yield on the Yellen trip. Enda, thank you very much. Meanwhile, the Biden administration ramps up, ramps up efforts to bring tech manufacturers Back home to the USA, the Commerce Department awarding Taiwan Semiconductors more than $11 billion in funding to build a home in Arizona. The Secretary, Gina Raimondo, says this. We will be making at scale the most advanced semiconductor chips on the planet here in the United States of America, by the way, with American workers. Mandeep Singh is with me from Bloomberg Intelligence. Again, this is round two of the stimulus. A couple of weeks ago, it was Intel 
Today it's TSMC. How advanced is this deal? What are they going to be producing in the USA? Yeah, look, I, I think the timing of it is clearly influenced by Intel getting a portion of the subsidies. And uh, in this case, I think TSMC went from $12 billion in the first round to $40 billion in the second, and now $65 billion total in subsidy uh, in investments in Arizona. So they're not diversifying the location. It's all in Arizona. And they are talking about doing 2 nanometer and 3 nanometer node manufacturing. So clearly, they... Uh, I think, you know, it's viable to produce those advanced semiconductors here. A lot of details still need to come out in terms of, you know, what are the uh, component suppliers doing? How are they thinking about packaging, testing? Because there's a lot that goes into manufacturing, not just setting up the foundry, which is the first step, obviously, but also all the other things that come with it. And probably the announcement of advanced nodes sort of indicates that everyone should be thinking about that uh, over the medium term. Well, the stock has accelerated. We were up 1.5% in the pre-market when we started broadcasting at 5 a.m. We're now up nearly 3%. What does this do? Or what is this? Is this a significant step towards American security, chip security, relative to where we were? Look, TSMC has the most credibility when it comes to advanced node manufacturing. They still have 92% share. Samsung is probably the remainder when it comes to advanced node manufacturing. So if TSMC is saying we can do 2 nanometer and 3 nanometer in the U.S. over the next five years, that tells you something that they should be able to do that at the gross margin they currently have, which is around 50%. So I think the subsidies kind of make it easier to uh, offset that gross margin impact that everyone was worried about. Okay, Mandeep, thank you very much. Uh, well, certainly the advance in the stock price this morning says it all. It's cheered along. Coming up, we'll give you your morning calls and a little bit later on Black, Black Rocks. Tony Dispirito joins me uh, around the opening bell ahead of the earnings season kicking off this Friday with the big banks on Bloomberg. this junction, growth stocks have some kind of an immunity to, to rising bond yields. 24 basis points in the past six sessions. Tesla is bid up this morning. Why are they really going to step back from cheaper models? There's no real clarity around that. Kathy Wood piles in, goes large, looks large in the ARK Innovation Fund, buying Tesla 9.8% of the fund, 9.8% uh, uh, holding in Tesla. There we go. NASDAQ is up a quarter of 1%. S&P 500 uh, also bid up. This is what the street is writing about this morning uh, in terms of your morning calls. You've got key bank downgrading Skyworks to sector weight, expecting lower growth due to mounting competition. Citigroup upgrades take two interactive to buy, highlighting favorable risk reward and compelling valuation. Finally, BMP Paribas downgrades Kroger to underperform. It's going to be a tough year ahead. BlackRock's Tony Dispirito joins me next around the opening bell. Start the week with a very comfortable bid. They're cheering at the Nicean at the Nasdaq. Amazon is bid up. Morgan Stanley raises the price target there to $215. So we're slightly better bid. Uh, Nasdaq is strong. Again, there's a, a force to be reckoned with in the equity market story from the earnings front, really punching back against those higher yields. There is the opening bell. The rest of your assets uh, look a little bit like this. You have got uh, flat on euro dollar 10840. You've just had Peter Shafiq with us uh, talking about uh, the scale of rate cuts in Europe relative to the United States could be higher. Yields are trimming some of their spike that we had this morning. We were up about four basis points when I came in at 5 a.m. We're now up two basis points. Again, the bond bulls are getting burned. Not are they getting burned, they're getting singed. But I wouldn't call it a, a complete collapse. Uh, there's not been a global ride. And oil comes back by an eighth of 1%. Again, just slowing down uh, the sell off in oil. It was up 4% last week in Brent. Uh, we're trying to work out what is the Iranian response to Israel going to be and how will that impact the oil market? One stock to watch is Tesla. The CEO, Elon Musk, has announced the EV maker will unveil its long-promised robo-taxi on August the 8th. Simone Foxman is with me. So this is the next promise, Simone, versus price cuts and product exits. 
Yeah, Madison, this news coming in a tweet after hours on Friday, but what this really means is the prospect of fully autonomous vehicles. This would be, of course, transformative, maybe even changing the way Americans travel uh, on roads around the country. And, of course, that stands to bring big benefits uh, for Tesla. It could either launch its own robo-taxi fleet. It could license the software to another service provider. It uh, could uh, sell them to others. It could do some version of all of these these things. And that's why Kathy Wood has made the projection that in part because of autonomous uh, vehicles, Tesla could see $100 billion in cash flow by 2027. The challenge is that all of this is extraordinarily speculative. At the moment, the full uh, the FSD, full self-driving capability, need, still needs to be 100% supervised. And the company has rolled this out to more people, including it has a subscription service for about $199 a month. It's offered some free trials, et cetera. That's, you know, behind the excitement. But at the same time, Ennis, as you referenced, this was uh, dovetailed with that Reuters story saying that Tesla was scrapping that $25,000 car, in part because it wanted to focus more on FSD. I think the only thing that we uh, see as positive here is that we're likely to get months of speculation as we await uh, that August announcement, trying to better understand exactly what is going to be announced, whether it is that full promised uh, autonomous vehicle, Manus. Okay, certainly rough and tumble but it's good to see the stock back again up two percent at the moment so well, thank you very much let's turn our attention to the airlines southwest and boeing are struggling this is the faa announces an investigation concerning a boeing plane abigail doolittle is on the story again more more bad news about boeing more negative news for Boeing and Southwest Airlines is a part of this story as well. So yesterday, a plane was taking off from Denver International Airport for Houston. Uh, the engine cover flew off the plane and hit the wing flap. Can you imagine being on a plane having that happen? Not surprisingly, the plane then grounded and those passengers were put onto another plane uh, and sent to Houston. They were arrived there three hours late. Now, this follows uh, another probe for Southwest Airlines regarding an incident in March uh, in LaGuardia Airport. And we, of course, all know Boeing's uh, issues. The stock's not down all that much around this. So I think that despite the fact that there's a lot of headline fear and news around uh, this, in Southwest, I should mention last Thursday, there was an engine fire that prevented uh, a plane from going from Texas to Las Vegas. Yes, another Boeing plane. I think that some of this is priced in at this point, given the fact that over the last year, love Southwest Airlines down more than 10 percent, as is the case for Boeing. The S&P 500 up nearly 30 percent. The airline index itself up about 7 percent. So some real underperformance. Investors, again, to some extent, Southwest Airlines at this point actually up a little bit. I think the bad news to some degree is priced in, Manus. OK, Abby, thank you very much. Let's turn our attention to crypto. Stocks linked to the digital currency rising. This is Bitcoin. Trades back above the $71,000 mark. Isabel Lee is with me. Isabel, uh, again, punching uh, in a pro-risk way for Bitcoin. Definitely, Manus. And it's now around $72,000. The number to watch is 73797 That's the high Bitcoin hit in March 14. And of course, as Bitcoin scales record high, crypto link stocks also soar. We have Marathon, Digital, and Riot all edging higher up at least 4%. There's a big pop there in Marathon. Uh, in MicroStrategy, it's up around 10%. So what is really the optimism driving Bitcoin? It's up around 70%. Last year, it was up 150%. It's really the successful debut of the spot Bitcoin ETFs we've seen, which have amassed a net inflow of $12 billion and around $60 billion in assets. And really, at the heart of this is supply and demand. There just really isn't enough supply as there is in demand because it's a spot Bitcoin ETF, so these issuers have to back them by the actual um, Bitcoin, not derivatives or swaps or anything like that. And we also have halving, which is known to really boost Bitcoin's price. But bringing it back to stocks, we have Stifle saying that if this is Bitcoin, Coins peak, it will signal a weaker stock market and a shift in leadership. Because as you know, a lot of the people in Wall Street look at Bitcoin as a proxy for speculative fever, for froth, for excess. So that's something to watch. But for now, it's a good day for crypto link stocks, Manus. Isabel, beautiful day for the crypto world. Uh, let's turn our attention across to the banking system. Jamie Dimon presenting his annual shareholder letter, just as JP Morgan and other banks are set to report at the end of the week. And this is what he writes. These markets seem to be pricing a 70 to 80 percent chance of a soft landing. I believe the odds are a lot lower than that. Joining me now, it is Katie Greifeld. So words of warning from Jamie Dimon. It's not the first time that he has warned. Last year, he was also warned about a slowdown. Here we are again. It's just maybe a little bit delayed. 
Here we are again. Yeah, of course, we always pay attention to his comments on the economy. He also talked a lot about AI. Jamie Dimon saying that AI, it could be as transformational as the steam engine. He said that AI could augment virtually every job. He also said, in addition to those soft landing uh, thoughts, that inflation may be stickier and rates higher than expected. Of course, this comes ahead of those big banks taking the stage, the big banks kicking off earnings season. You have JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, and Citi all taking the stage on Friday. So JP Morgan, of course, they notched the highest annual profit in history of American banking last year. We'll see if they can put up a repeat performance. Of course, of course those numbers expected pre-market on Friday. Citi is also an interesting one, of course. Jane Fraser's big restructuring push, cutting thousands of jobs and entire business divisions. They're actually leading the big banks so far year to date. Wall Street loves a comeback story. But actually, when you take a look at all three of those banks, they're up double digits so far in 2024, handily outperforming the S&P 500 so far this year. Of course, when it comes to how sustainable that lead is, a lot hinges on this earnings season. Okay, Getty, thank you very much. Our next guest weighs in on what's next for the equity market. Actively bullish. While the near-term pullback wouldn't be surprising, we see fuel for positive momentum to continue throughout the year, but selection growing more important. It is Tony Dispirito, Global CIO, Fundamental Equities at BlackRock. Good to see you, Tony. So yields at 44 cruising towards 4.5%, people talking about 5%, don't seem to be upsetting the equity apple cart yet. So a couple of things. One is, you know, I think it's always about earnings uh, and valuation. Uh, you know, on the earnings front, I see things as being very strong. The economy, if anything, appears to be accelerating. We certainly saw that with the, the jobs report on Friday. Really a blowout number. We see the ISM manufacturing you know, above 50 for the first time since uh, September of 2022. So economically, things look pretty strong. Now, yes, in terms of valuations, if you look at the S&P 500 kind of on a naive basis, you'd say valuations look relatively high. But I think what that misses is a couple of things. One is the quality of the companies in the S&P 500 mm -hmm. and the growth rate of those companies is higher than ever before. So we've never seen such profitable companies growing at this rate. And then secondarily, if you kind of look at stocks versus bonds, as you mentioned, um, if you look at the equally weighted S&P 500, the equity risk premium, i.e. the gap in yield, earnings yield on stocks versus bonds, looks almost exactly in line with historical averages. Okay, so there's perhaps a little bit further to go. I mean, when we talk about the S&P 500 and the performance over the past month, we've gone through the AI and the MAG7 as dominance, and that is still there. But if I look at the rotation into, as I was saying to my last couple of guests, into commodities and into financials, it's very, very prevalent. And again, you, you talk about selection being ever more important. To what extent do you want more exposure to those kind of cyclical, uh, cyclical sectors? So I do think the broadening of the market, whether that's in materials, energy, or financials, as you point out, I think that's very healthy, a very healthy sign. So I really like that. Um, and then, you know, secondarily, um, I think it's really important that when you think about the major themes, themes like artificial intelligence, uh, themes like the adoption of a low low carbon economy, that you look beyond the obvious, that when you take a bottoms up perspective, mm -hmm. Over time, the winners and losers will evolve, the valuations will evolve, and so I think there's a real value add from an active perspective in those, in those mega themes, if you will. And that plays to what Jamie Dimon was talking about in his annual letter, and, 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 and this is very, very real. We're all beginning to try to understand what AI actually means, and he says this, over time, we anticipate that our use of AI has the potential to augment virtually every job. Think of the printing press, the steam engine, electricity, computing, the internet, amongst others. I, I mean, this is, you know, he's the leader of one of the most profitable banks in the world, and it just shows you how pervasive AI is going to be. My, my question to you is this, when we go for breadth and we try to think about, well, where else can I buy apart from NVIDIA uh, and maybe the poor man's Broadcom, do you look more globally? And again, I ask you this question because the valuations in the US relative to the valuations within AI in a global perspective, how much broader do you need to reach for AI? 
Yeah, well, as you point out, I think there's two ways to think about it. One is to think about things more globally. Certainly, you know, the U.S. has been the best performing market for over a decade now. And what that's meant is if you look at the U.S. in MSC Acqui, it's now over 63 percent of the index. So the U.S. is becoming increasingly dominant market worldwide. But yes, there are opportunities to look more broadly Uh, geographically. In the fund I run, the equity dividend fund, it's primarily a U.S. fund, but we've invested about 20 percent of our assets outside of the U.S. on that basis, in global companies, by the way. Um, secondarily, in themes like AI, you know, I think the obvious winners are in the hardware layer, but as you think more broadly, you should think about data, right? Private data versus public data. Public data is a commodity. Private data becomes more valuable with artificial intelligence. So think about the companies that own that data and sell that data. They can sell it for higher prices as AI makes that private data more valuable. There are service providers who clean and organize data. They become more important. And then finally, think about all the memory that's needed to store and process that data. Right? We're, we're at the beginning of what could be a memory super cycle. And then you think about companies like in the financial services sector, where there's a lot of regulatory expense, a lot of SG&A mm -hmm. overhead. A lot of that can be taken out through AI or reduced through AI. And the companies that are on the forefront of that, the larger banks, are likely to be the ones who get the most cost advantage, for instance. So I think there's a lot of ways to play the growth of artificial intelligence beyond the most obvious stocks. And again, that's where that bottoms up valuation uh, approach really uh, comes to an advantage. Yeah, and, and, and as you say, it's about selling data, mining data, and owning data is the breath there. Look, we're seeing a bit of a bounce in Tesla. I know that you can't necessarily talk about individual names, but it is about the principle of where we are in the evolution of EV. These are about the megatrends that you talk about. Whether we think it's a short-term issue with electric vehicles, or is there something much more structurally headwinded for that sector, what do you think at this juncture? Look, without a doubt, EV sales have slowed. We see it in the numbers. But long term, I don't think the trajectory is changing that much, particularly as new models, new vehicles come out, as battery life gets extended. You know, not only is this good for the, for the environment, but it's also a great driving experience. So I would expect EV sales to continue to grow over time. You know, any adoption of new technology will have ebbs and flows to it. So this isn't surprising. One of my favorite ways to play it in my fund, the equity dividend fund, has been through automotive tech. Companies that make automotive semiconductors, make connectors, et cetera, you know, they benefit not only from EV adoption, but also from the adoption of ADAS, um, Advanced Driver Assisted Systems. And that's going to happen regardless of whether it's a, a gas engine or EV engine. So I think that's a great way of playing it. The other interesting way is through electric utilities. I mean, if you look at electricity consumption in the United States, it's been about flat for 20 years. And that's a combination of us moving to a more service-oriented economy, as well as just more energy efficiency, whether it's in appliances or lighting. But what we're seeing now is a real pickup in demand for the first time. Some of that's due to EVs, mm -hmm. and some of that's due to data centers related to, to artificial intelligence. And so I think that's a trend that you can also play. Um, and by the way, if you look at the valuations of utility stocks, they're, you know, they've historically traded a discount to the S&P 500, but that discount has actually grown despite the great long-term outlook in terms of fundamentals. Okay. I, it's certainly an observation on the electricity side. And indeed, I had an energy company here recently, and they were talking about the use of energy here in the U.S. spiking relative to the underusage in Europe, and that is down to the data center growth here relative to what else is to come in Europe. Tony, thank you very much. Tony Despirito, uh, my guest this morning from Blank Rock. Coming up, uh, pressure intensifies on Israel. We have been increasingly frustrated, and again, that was uh, a core message that the president delivered to Prime Minister Netanyahu in their phone call this week, this past week, that if they've got to do more, they've got to make changes. The pressure from the USA on Israel. That conversation next. We have been increasingly frustrated, and again, that was uh, a core message that the president delivered to Prime Minister Netanyahu in their phone call this week, this past week, that if they've got to do more, they've got to make changes. Now, the prime minister assured the president that he would do that.
We've seen some announcements in those early hours. That's welcome. We got to see more. We've got to see it over time. As the Israel Hamas war reaches its six month mark, military officials say that Israel is pulling some troops out of Gaza, with Netanyahu claiming that victory is coming. Oil prices are at a pivotal juncture as they try to maintain their ascent above the $90 a barrel level in Brent. Amri Hordern is with me on the politics. Will Kennedy is on the physical market with me. Amri, to you, first of all, uh, we've seen, again, more rhetoric. The president spoke to Netanyahu on Thursday. There were some small pieces of action in regards to aid. But there seems to be some kind of progress uh, in terms of troop reduction. But there are warnings coming through from Iran as well. Yeah, and some are saying that potentially there's progress when it comes to troops, Israeli troops coming out of Gaza, that potentially has to do with the pressure the United States is putting on Benjamin Netanyahu. But then over the weekend, we had Senator Chris Coons, who's very close to the Biden administration, and he said in the face of a threat of a real attack from the north from Hezbollah or a direct attack from Iran, he potentially thinks that's why this was more of a tactical decision of what Israel was doing. But when it comes to the politics of this, there's even members within Biden's own party, within the Democratic Party, a look to the Sunday shows with Chris Van Hollen said to Margaret Brennan on Face the Nation, that are confused because they feel like Biden did not set the consequences out of what those consequences would be, depending on how Netanyahu was to go into Rafa. Well, calling for that immediate uh, ceasefire in the latter part of last Thursday seemed to invoke some kind of movement. Amri, thank you very much. Well, Kennedy has been tracking the oil market. Last week, there was a spirited attempt by Brent up 4%. Uh, and in terms of that move, Will, in the oil market, it's just pulled back ever so slightly this morning. But we don't know how much geopolitical risk there is in these prices. No, and I think after the very strong run we had uh, last week, uh, a breather is probably to be expected. I don't think the market has fundamentally changed uh, over the weekend. There are still concerns about existing supply, the risk to future supply against the background, as we've been describing in recent weeks and months, of robust demand, and that hasn't changed. Clearly, the market is focused on the geopolitical risks, and they will still be alive uh, to the prospects of any Iranian retaliation um, for the events of, uh, of recent weeks. Uh, by Israel, but uh, we wait to see. I don't think there's been a fundamental shift. I think that we are quite a long way from where we are at 90. It surprised a lot of people, and I think there's probably a sense that we need to take stock um, before uh, we go higher from here. But one interesting thing we did see today was the head of uh, commodities at Citadel, one of the biggest commodities investors in the world, saying he thinks the oil market's about to get very, very tight. So that means all eyes will be on OPEC for their policy decision in the second half of the year. Well, that makes the June meeting all the more important, doesn't it, Will? If they have the ability to switch on these taps, and obviously we'll have some American supply come back on board as well. All eyes down on that. Team, thank you very much. I'm Lee Hoarder. And on the politics, Will Kennedy on the energy markets for some sector price action. Abigail Doolittle is with me side by side on set. What have we got, Abby? So overall, we have the S&P 500 literally doing nothing, fractionally lower on very light volume, 10% uh, below the 20-day average. Up top, though, consumer discretionary, the best sector, up 8 tenths of 1%. And most sectors in fact, as you can see, higher. So not a lot of participation, small moves there. Consumer discretionary being helped out by Tesla up 4.6%, perhaps on that robo-taxi. Tech down four-tenths of 1%, which is interesting because if we take a look at one sector that is outperforming over the last two days, this, of course, is the SOX up more than 1% over the last two days. And today, of course, that good TSMC news. And we also, around U.S. grants, we also have uh, Micron trading higher. So chips after a little bit of wobbliness last week, well, today, and uh, Friday, they are higher back to back. Okay, that'll give us a, a, a nice little support level. Abby, thank you very much. Coming up on the show, the market moving events to set your clock by on your trading diary right here on Bloomberg.
juxtaposition between the pop and drop in 10-year government bond yields. That's uh, the underbelly to these equity markets. 10-year yields popped by uh, a few more basis points this morning. That is Europe and Asia playing catch-up. We come back ever so slightly. The Russell 2000 up by a half of 1%, even though we push these rate cuts into the longer grass. NASDAQ back to flat at the moment. You need to set your agenda for the rest of the week, and this is what it looks like. Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari speaks at 7 p.m. Eastern. Wednesday, it's another big day. It is CPI for the United States. PPI follows through and the initial jobless claims come on Thursday. We also get the ECB rate decision. Finally, the big bank earnings will dominate Wall Street. JP Morgan, Wells Fargo and Citi post their results as Jamie Diamond warns of higher inflation and it could all be a little bit more sticky. That was countdown to the open this Monday morning from New York. Good morning.